Hi everybody! If you missed the live lesson today, this is a video just going over what we spoke about and the assignments that we need to do. So at today's lesson, we looked at the designers needed for product design A level. Now, these designers are Beth and Gray, which is the lady by here, and James Dicer. Now, if you'd like to have a go at the Neopod that we did, I have a student paced version of the Neopod so you can work through it at your own pace add into the questions and watch some of the videos that we watched in the lesson. So that link is just by here. Just click on that link, enter your name, and then you can do it at your own pace. Okay, so the first designer, James Dyson. So this poster here shows you some of his most famous products that he's designed. There's a QR code there which you can scan with your phones to take you into more detail about James Dyson and to his website and just a bit more about him. So his style, his products are found in the marketplace. They're unique, they are brightly coloured. You can always tell when it's a Dyson. He believes in form as well as function. But the function is more important to James Dyson. He wants to know that his project works. And then he considers the actual form and the way it looks afterwards. This is really important to him as well. He's influenced the design world because he's not afraid. He's not afraid to develop an existing idea, something that already exists. Let's try and make it better. He's not constantly thinking, how can I think of something new? He made over 5,000 prototypes when he developed his first vacuum cleaner. OK, so, you know, he didn't just go, oh, that one works, that's OK. He kept going until it was perfect. So cyclone technology, function over form, but form is also important. He's a British design engineer. He has user centred design is really important. Environmental issues. He's a massive problem solver, but all of his designs are very simple and aesthetically pleading, pleasing. Now, there are further videos and reading that you can do on these links here, so you can do that in your own time, but we are going to watch a video. My name's James Dyson and I'm a design engineer. When James graduated from the Royal College of Art in 1970, his first project was the sea truck, a high speed boat for use in the navy. Okay, so this was his first project that he worked on. So this is what really inspired him to become a design engineer rather than an artist. Now this was for the Royal Navy. Navy. A few years later, James was renovating his house. He became frustrated with his wheelbarrow. The narrow wheel meant it got stuck in the mud, it was hard to balance, and cement stuck to the metal sides. So you can see here that he, from observation, he has realised that his wheelbarrow that he's using is just completely ineffective. It's heavy, it's not stable. All of the cement sticks to the side of it. It's got sharp metal corners which can cause a safety hazard. And the wheel, the rubber wheel here, sinks into the ground when it's being used. So to him, it's just not very practical at all. This frustration inspired him to develop the ball barrow. James replaced the small wheel with a large inflatable ball, making it easier to move. He also changed the material to lightweight, non-stick plastic. Thinking differently had helped James to solve the design problem. In 1993, I invented the first bagless vacuum cleaner. It wasn't easy. In fact, it took me 5,127 prototypes to get it right. When James bought a brand new Hoover, he was disappointed. It didn't work as well as he'd hoped. So again, from observation, he's tried a product. He doesn't like it. It doesn't work properly. So he's getting frustrated. A designer or an engineer would often have these frustrations. Think about it yourself. Have you ever been in a situation where you're like, oh, I just wish that this product could. Oh, it'd be so much easier if we had this or if this existed. They're all design and engineer thoughts. As it lost suction and didn't pick up the dirt. One day, when James was out walking, he passed a factory. On its roof was a special system to separate dirt from the air and expel clean air. It was a so at this sawmill, the, um, James spotted this and he used the analogy problem solving method to be able to take something and then use those principles to make something else. So really similar to when we looked at Velcro. The cyclone. 
was to inspire James to try the same in his vacuum. He rushed home and built a big cardboard circle, and it worked. James knew he was onto something. There was still a long way to go. James persevered with his idea, and after 5,127 prototypes, he produced the first Dyson Badness vacuum. I now have over 700 design engineers working with me here at our headquarters in Wiltshire. Their job is to solve problems and redesign. Okay, so you can see that James Dyson, so if we just do a recap, like everyone else, he gets frustrated by products that just don't work properly. As design engineers, they do something about it. It's all about invention and improvement. So making the product work better, function better for the user to make their lives easier. Now, this was the ball barrow. So this is one of his first ones. So just to recap, James was born in 1947. He studied art and classics at school. He went on to the Royal College of Art. He studied many different types of design, but he developed a real interest in design engineering and then graduated in 1970. He then joined an engineering company called Retalk. His first project was the sea truck, a high speed boat for use in the Royal Navy. A few years later, when James was renovating his house, he became really frustrated with his wheelbarrow. The narrow wheel meant it got stuck in the mud and was really hard to balance and the cement stuck to the metal sides of the wheelbarrow. So this frustration inspired James to develop the ball barrow. He replaced the small wheel with a large inflatable fanatic ball, making it easier to move around. He also changed the material to a lightweight plastic, making sure that it was non-stick so nothing would actually stick to the plastic and it's easily cleaned. He then rounded off the edges. Thinking differently helped James to solve this problem. Now, these are some slides from the live lesson that we did. You can contribute to these by going on to the Neopod. In 1978, so eight years after graduating from university, again, James became frustrated with his vacuum cleaner. So from observation, he became frustrated. So he took it apart, which is reverse engineering. He discovered it was the bag. It was clogging with dust, causing the suction to drop. And he wondered if he could solve this problem. So he came across the idea of cyclone for a vacuum cleaner. He found this by looking at the sawdust collecting at a system at a sawmill. He decided to investigate if this same principle could be used with a vacuum cleaner, went home, created a cardboard model and found out that it could potentially work. So this is using the analogy problem solving method. Then 5,127 prototypes later, he invented the world's first bagless vacuum cleaner. Dyson's vacuum cleaner was first sold in Japan, the home of high-tech products. Now, this product here was known as the G-Force. It was really popular with the Japanese market, really popular, and they sold at $2,000 a piece. He then went on to win the 1991 International Design Fair Prize in Japan. People were attracted to the product because of its unique look and its design, but then this made them curious about how does this product actually work? Why is it different to the vacuum cleaner I already have at home? So 5,127 prototypes later, and we get the DC01, the world's first bagless vacuum cleaner. Now, with this product development, he used the money from G4 sales. Dyson set up his own company, and he opened his own research centre and factory, and he began working on this new vacuum that would capture even the smallest particles of dust. It was called the DC01. This is a design classic and icon. It sets the bar for every other one from this vacuum cleaner onwards. Now, he also has other products, such as the Dyson Supersonic hairdryer. He has the Dyson fans, which don't rely on rotating blades. The fan draws in air, and purifies it and allows a smooth, powerful airflow into the atmosphere. No blades, no grills, fewer components to manufacture, less materials to ship, easier for the consumer to clean, so overall, much better product. He also has the cordless vacuum cleaner and the air blade hand dryer, as well as many other products. If you look on his website, you'll be able to find loads more. So this sheet here is just to help you with an overview. I've put all the information onto one sheet so you can see it, observing it, reverse engineering, analogy problem solving, 
prototypes, consumer testing and feedback, product development, and then, wow, innovation happened. He has the world's first bagless cyclo vacuum cleaner. So your first task that I'd like you to do is looking at the DC01, or you could choose another Dyson product, I really don't mind, is then doing a critical product analysis on James Dyson's products. Now remember, it needs to be critical, so you're looking at advantages. What's good about this? What's good about having the yellow ABS plastic parts as the mechanical parts, and then the grey as the ergonomic and user-centered design parts? What's good about that? What's not so good about it? What if you don't like yellow? Okay, so you need to be critical when you're looking at these. So first of all, say what you see, then think, is this good? Is this bad? What could be improved? Could I make this better? Okay, so you're really thinking critically about this product analysis. Remember, the purpose of a product analysis is to show us what's already good about the products that exist and what's not so good. So therefore, whatever's not so good is what you as a designer should focus on making better. So the aesthetics, colours. They like no other vacuum. Plastic injection molded parts in bright colours. The colours guide you to the buttons and the main parts. The grey parts are ergonomically designed for the user and the yellow parts are all mechanical. For environment, he's got a reduced weight. Now, the Dyson Digital Motor V6 weighs only 218 grams, but yet it generates 425 watts of power. They're power efficient, they're lighter, they're smaller, requires less packaging, less energy, less transportation. Okay, there's no bags or replacement filters, so there's less waste. They're really easy to clean. Okay, they've got a minimum amount of parts, and there's guarantees on all of the parts of James Dyson's products. Technology, bagless design, unique, powerful, it's iconic, there's no filters, so you don't have to wash them. Okay, they've got a quicker drying time, new technology, innovative technology, so therefore really innovative in the technology that they're using. The product life cycle, so Dyson promises to take back any broken products so he can analyse why they actually failed in the first place and then make changes. Okay, so therefore the product life cycle, so when you buy the Dyson, you know it's going to probably last you for a long time. So your assignment for the essay is discuss James Dyson's application of aesthetics and consideration for the user in the product shown. So we've got the DC01 here. Now again, if you want to change it, you need to include a different image. Eight mark questions, so high tariff, needs paragraphs, advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so you're being critical. You're talking like a product designer. You're not talking about like somebody just on the street that I just walked up to and said, hey, what can you tell me about Dyson? Everybody will be able to tell me something about James Dyson. Okay, so you don't want to be talking like that. You want to talk like you actually know James Dyson. You know a bit about his work. You know some interest in facts. You know things that people on the street will not know. Okay, so I've given you a writing frame here. So introduction, give an overview of Dyson, short, but shows that you know who he is and why he's an innovative design engineer. Second paragraph. Think of three parts of the aesthetics. So the ones that pop out to me, colour, materials, and shape and form. Okay, then paragraph three, the other things that really will affect the user, because that's the next part of the question. So the environment, the product life cycle, the reduce, reuse, and recycling motto that Dyson has. Then paragraph four, conclusion, just summarise how well Dyson uses aesthetics, or maybe you think, how well he doesn't use aesthetics to make the product easier for the user. So an example of this is the different colour parts for the product. So the user knows this is the handle for me to hold and it's going to be comfortable, but this yellow bit here does something else, something mechanical. There's an example here then of a really good answer showing you how to maybe answer this question. There's an optional task here now if you really wanted to challenge yourself past paper question. So you could have a go at this. There's a video here for you as well, which you can click to get some extra help with this question. And then I've got the answer bank and the mark scheme. Now what could be really good for this is maybe you write it and get someone in your house to actually mark it using the mark scheme for you. Okay, so moving on, we've got Beth and Gray. Beth and Gray is a Welsh 
product designer. Her inspiration comes from natural materials such as wood, marble, leather, slate. She believes in using the best quality materials and works really closely with master craftsmen. She combines natural techniques with cutting edge technology and manufacturing, inspired by everyday items and culture and travel and landscape. And she's interested in how you can design beautiful objects by repurposing natural waste. So let's tell a story about Beth and Gray. Beth and Gray combines a passion for luxurious natural materials, leather, marble, solid wood, with an extensive knowledge of craftsmanship and cutting edge manufacturing technologies. Gray's warm contemporary designs reflect her personal history, strongly rooted to the traditional Welsh culture and craft, inspired from everyday items that surround us all, to the objects and buildings discovered whilst travelling the globe. After leaving college, she became design director at Habitat, producing furniture collections, including the Parker and Hannah ranges. She won the L Decoration Award and then set up her own design studio in 2008, producing furniture for John Lewis, Harrods and Liberty of London. As you can see here, wood is the material Grey loves working with the most. And for the Noah collection, she took inspiration from many sources, vintage herringbone flooring, piles of wood stacked up on factory floors, ancient wooden sheds, and even the roof on the new Pompidou Met Centre in northeastern France, which if you haven't been to, Google the Pompidou Museum. It is the most insane piece of architecture you'll ever see. You've got the carved coffee table here, so Beth and Gray uses high quality natural materials. Now this smooth marble top, is really important for the carved coffee table. She said she likes the way that the marble has a vein running through it and it's to reflect her traditional Welsh culture and craft. Now here, Beth and Gray says that the product life cycle of her furniture is to fit into modern and traditional environments. And it's a piece of furniture that just won't go out of fashion because it's traditional, it's master craftsmanship. It will always fit within your home. Using technology, she says, even though she doesn't make anything herself, when she begins a project, she works really closely with the craftspeople. We work out how to make things. For instance, the brogue table, which is this one here, is made of two different types of leather. And it's very difficult to make. It's made in the UK and it's actually a combination of craft and technology. It would be very difficult to do all of this by hand. And it would also be very difficult to do it all by machine. So it's a combination of both. And this is a process that she really enjoys working with. So looking back at this brogue table, it's an elegant handmade leather topped side coffee table made from high quality top grain leather, treated to give it a durable finish featuring a handmade intricately detailed leather strip with decorative designs running through the leather okay it's then waxed to improve the durability of the product so the aesthetics of her work is really simple but it has an aspect of design that stops it being plain the brogue table has not just materials that make it look luxurious but also their decorative details Okay, the edge of the brogue table is stitched like a brogue shoe. Okay, so it's that detailed. Now, this stripy collection down the bottom here is the Alice collection, and this was inspired by her travels across Europe and the Arab states. She says where she was struck by the use of black and white stone configurations in Italy and Switzerland and the pattern and form in Arabic design. This is where Beth and Gray starts to consider the environment. Now, Nature Squid is an organisation that was put up which, where you could reimagine sustainable and natural materials, waste byproducts of other industries and fast-growing natural materials, and transform them into something beautiful. So, something that shows off master craftsmanship and cutting-edge technologies to show people that this is not waste. This can be reused and repurposed. So Beth and Gray teamed up with these and she's created a collection called Exploring Eden. It's the first collection to come out of this new partnership between Nature Squid and Beth and Gray. 
So abalone is eaten as a delicacy throughout East Asia, and it's widely fished in the Philippines. However, the Philippines was badly hit by a super typhoon in 2013. Nature Squid is contributing to the rebuilding of this fishing community. So whilst wild populations of abalone are threatened in many parts of the world, this smaller variety is plentiful, so there's lots of them. So once it's fished, the meat is harvested and sold to local restaurants. Nature Squid then buys the shells, giving the discarded waste some monetary value. So then this can be reinvested into sustainable fishing practice. Now Nature Squid then gave these shells to Beth and Gray, and Beth and Gray have created these beautiful pieces, as you can see here, out of these waste products. Again here, these goose feathers used in the cylinder stools are a byproduct of farming and food industry. Goose down is already widely known for its use in clothing and bedding, but the quills are less readily sold and therefore often discarded. Each feather is individually hand-tinted black from the base, graduating through the natural white of the feather's tip. They are then matched for size and symmetry and laid by hand and sealed with a layer of clear resin, creating this effect here. So again, using a byproduct, she's able to create these beautiful pieces. And by buying these feathers, they're not going into waste and it's given back to those communities. Now, this piece here is stunning. It is from an oyster shell known as the window pane oyster shell. Nature Squared again buys these discarded shells, which is used as an alternative to glass. And then it's created into these beautiful pieces. So you can see here, you've got some of the products using the abalone and then using the feathers and the oyster shells. So then we're moving on to the Shamsian collection. Now, this is one of my favourites, and if you go onto the website, you will be able to find out some more information. So, we're just going to go onto the website now and have a look at what we can find. So you can see here that she's taken inspiration from this wall to create the repeated pattern that is used on her furniture. Now this is a master craftsman and these are natural materials that come from this area. So you can see how she's using the materials from this culture, from this country, from this area to be able to make her products. And the craftsman Mohammed Jasmian is also there to offer these skills of traditional crafts. See, they're all hand cut, they're all made by hand. Very time consuming, but then you can really connect into the product. And this is spray to give it extra colour depth and tone. Thank you. 
finished piece. So, the Shamsian collection is inspired by Bethany's family heritage and her extensive travels throughout the Middle East. She carefully observed the way the sunlight falls across the Nevaza and also the traditional culture that they have. So she said that my family heritage and my own travels and research continually draw me to the Middle Eastern art and culture as a source of inspiration. Oman is an incredible place. The fort of Nizwa really captured my imagination. Even though the most complex pattern become harmonious when you get it just right, I think that my instinct for geometry comes from my family's Indian and Middle Eastern heritage. Working with skilled craftsmen is at the heart of what I do. It's such a privilege to be able to create contemporary products in collaboration with talented artisans, working with such incredible techniques. So here are some products from the collection. You can see from coffee cups to tables to cabinets and units. So again, I'd like you to do a product analysis on one of Beth and Gray's products, our collections. Now you can use the Shazmian one that you have here, or again, you can choose your own one. Maybe you feel drawn to the Alice collection. Remember to be critical. Remember to look at advantages and disadvantages. Again, then, similar to your James Dyson one, you've got a discuss Beth and Gray's application of aesthetics and consideration for the user in her products. So give an introduction, short, but shows you know who she is and that she's an influential product designer. Remember, talk like a designer, not just someone off the street or not someone who's just decided to stick her name into Google and find out that she created a table. Okay, you're actually going to be talking like you know who she is. Then your second paragraph, you want to look at the aesthetics, given examples of products. So I would start with the materials, the natural materials, the marble, the wood, the leather, the slate. Okay, the cost doesn't matter to Beth and Gray, it's the quality and the source. Then you might want to look at the design, so the fact that it's inspired by nature, culture, doors, bells, windows, churches, sunlight, landscape. And also then the culture, so the fact that she travels and she gets inspired by craftsmen, techniques, the area, culture, religion, food. Then in the next paragraph, other things to consider, the environment, ethics, quality, product life cycle, cost. And then the last one, summarise how well Grey uses aesthetics to make her products easier or more appealing for the user. Then you've got an example here. So what's really great about this example is that they've included pictures to show what they're talking about. So they've actually identified the reader with the product that they are currently talking about. Then an additional challenge question, so a design question, which was a past paper question. I know some of you have done this in class. Design a Bluetooth speaker inspired by the work of Beth and Gray must be freestanding and include 2D and 3D viewpoints as well as annotation. Okay, this was part of a 40 mark question in the exam last year. So give that one a go and you can take a photograph and send that to me as well. Okay, so other than that, you will find your assignment in the Teams page, one for Beth and Gray, one for James Dyson. You can do it on paper with pen for both of them, the product analysis and the essay, and then upload a picture, or you can do it all digitally, I really don't mind. 
And if you want to do the questions that we went through in the live lesson, then you can go on the Nearpod here. Other than that, any questions, pop them into the Teams channel. And hope you're all staying safe. Any questions, remember to ask me. Thanks, guys. Bye.